But Lord, You can utilize this simple yet seemingly profound truth to challenge us in our walk in this world. We love You, Lord, and I thank You for each and every person that is here today. And ask that You would bless now in this. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 is where I'd like for you to take your Bibles and open them and turn to those pages of Scripture where we want to discover a truth that I believe is something that each and every one of us need to grasp and need to understand. And I believe a truth that will help us in that practical everyday thing we call life. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, we see in verse 19, and I'm just going to go ahead and read through these three verses, and then we'll go back and take them one by one and understand here what the Lord is saying and how it applies to our life. It says in verse 19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are His. And let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified in meat for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. I want to talk to you this morning on the subject of vessels of use. Vessels of use use. I think this is something that we will be able to certainly practically understand of the illustration that the Lord chooses to use in this passage of Scripture and to be able to carry it over into our life and help us to understand some of the ideas of being utilized in the service or in the work of our Heavenly Father. Now, the first thing I want to start with today is this, the declaration of vessels. The declaration of vessels. When you consider that perspective or that word of declaration, the first thing that kind of came to my mind is whenever you're on an airplane and you're flying into a foreign country, you must fill out a form that they call the declaration form. And on that form, you must declare, declare whatever possessions that you have in your uh, uh, baggage or on your person that meets their criteria. In fact, I don't know that it's a problem with this anyone in this room, but if you carry more than $10,000 in cash across the border, it's important for you to declare it. And what's that? Do you? Well, the brother, let's talk about things. <laughs> In fact, they've come to the point now where they have money sniffing dogs. That if you don't declare it and you, get ta uh, uh, you end up coming in contact with one of them little pups, they're going to alert somebody that you have a little extra money, all right? And so it's important for you to declare it. And so when you declare it, though, you're making a statement like Brother Patrick and saying, this is my money, all right? I have this much money in my uh, possession. Well, today, before we even get to this vessel of, of use thing, we need to understand that the Lord has made a declaration. And his declaration is this, he knows those that are his. Amen? Amen. He knows those that are his, his. In fact, that verse 19 says it this way. It says, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Standeth sure. Now, whenever you think of a foundation, we think of that which is something is built upon. We think of that, that, that firm place in which uh, uh, it, it, it's settled, it's secure, it is strengthened enough to be able to handle whatever is built upon that particular foundation. And this is the amazing thing is that we have an opportunity today to build our life upon a very sure foundation. And that foundation is founded in our chief cornerstone who happens to be the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now, if you are one of the crowd that have rejected Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you have rejected Him as the chief cornerstone, then your life is built on a different foundation. A foundation that I believe will crumble and will collapse and so will your life go with it. Folks, it's amazing today. When you look at it, go back here, uh, verse uh, uh, 16. Well, let's go to verse 15 because I think it's a very instructive verse for us. It says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of what? Truth. Truth. Truth is an important aspect of this scriptures. Dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Profane, we could think of that perspective of perverted and vain. We can think of that aspect of empty. A lot of people like to talk about religion in a very profane and vain manner. And it does nothing because it is religion that is built upon man's philosophy. And what happens? It will increase unto more ungodliness. Now verse 17, he mentions a very specific aspect. He said, and their word will eat as doth a canker. That word canker there is the same word that we would utilize as gangrene. Gangrene. And I've never had to see pers that I can remember other than pictures, all right? Gangrene in real life. But we recognize when somebody gets frostbite, that one of the difficulties or the dangers of frostbite is when that circulation stops moving throughout the body, infection can set in, and many times they call that infection gangrene. And we recognize even from some of the scriptures that there is a type of gangrene, a type of canker that is a very flesh-devouring uh, infection and can eat up, the literally eat up the body of an individual. And that is what that word is indicating when you get into this profane and vain babblings. You, you, the, the, it works within us like a, like a gangrene that's going to spread throughout the body and cause eventual destruction. And he mentions these two guys, Hymenaeus and uh, Philetus, uh, who, verse 18, concerning the truth, have erred. You see, they got off the truth. They got away from the truth. And in getting away from the truth, they put in jeopardy that foundation. Here's what they said, the resurrection is past already, and that's when the gangrene set in and it overthrew the faith of some. The others were looking for that resurrection, looking for uh, the rapture, looking for the return of Jesus Christ, looking for that day when our, uh, our bodies will be uh, glorified and our bodies will be taken up and we'll be able to experience that home in heaven. Don't let anybody ever talk you out of that. This world is not our home. It's not our final resting place. Our citizenship as believers is in a another place, a heavenly place, all right, that will be uh, forever. So once these guys, through their false uh, teaching and false preaching, once they add something that is not according to truth, they began to overthrow the faith of some, and yet then verse 19 comes into play, nevertheless, nevertheless, despite what we receive out there in the world or in religious circles or even in the false teaching of some well-meaning individual, we have a foundation that is of God that standeth sure and having this seal this is the seal the seal was the the signet the seal was the um uh, the, the i don't even know what they call it, the stamp that was placed on something to authorize that document or that something as being from that individual who placed the seal on it and many times it was in light of a king a king would have his word recorded, have his statement recorded, have his request or his command recorded, and once he put that signet on it, once he put that seal on it, then as they used to say with the Mede and Persian Empire, so be it, that is law now. It cannot be uh, reversed. Here's the seal today of the foundation that is sure, and it's this, God knows you are His. And I'm glad He's a very knowledgeable God. <laughs> 
He knows it. We don't have to sit here and guess, well, does God know that I'm really His? Is God really thinking about me today? Is God really have my uh, uh, being on His mind? And, and, and is the Lord, when I get to heaven, is the Lord going to remember me? Is He going to know that, that I was saved? Is He going to know that I trusted Him? And, 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 and we get that. Okay, so we go to heaven and God will know us. But here's the fact is God knows you right here, right now. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you're facing, God knows that you are His. Now, on the flip side of it, what else does God know? He knows if you're not His. And that's just as sure that Him knowing that you are His, except that it's the wrong side to be on. You say, if you're going to be a vessel this morning, can I tell you, you need to be a declared vessel of the Lord our God, our Heavenly Father. You need to be His vessel. I think of it in this sense, really the reality is, is every one of us are vessels. You don't have a choice in that matter. You're a vessel of something. You're a vessel that is being used in some way or somehow. Now whether you're being used for the Lord or as we've seen in the past here, the devil, right? Because those that are uh, unsaved, the father is the devil. And when, the, when your father is the devil, you're going to do what your father tells you to do. And he has a certain will. He has a certain use for you. And, and you can see that throughout the word of God, that principle that, that resonates. And we also see that in, in just the life that we live. But, but I want to encourage you this morning in this. If you're not the Lord, you need to take care of that issue. You need to take care of that item. You need to find out what true salvation is. You need to seek somebody out who can take the Word of God and explain to you uh, what it means to be born again, what it means to be the child of the King. And then once you have that settled and once you have that uh, declared, then we know the Lord knows us now. The Lord knows you and you are His. We saw that this morning in the book of Corinthians. It talks about our bodies being the temple of the Holy Ghost because, listen, we've been purchased, we've been bought. We are no longer our own. We're His. We're here to serve Him. We're here to live for Him. And you say, Pastor, why do you keep reminding us of that? Because we keep forgetting that. We keep living the life like it's our life to live. You know, I find myself, and I'm sure you're not like me, but just in case you are, I find myself sometimes complaining about my situations. Whatever the reason is, you know the different situations that come into your life that make you complain, that make you bellyache, right? And I'm starting to learn this. I'm starting to get to this right conclusion. That when I complain about my situation, essentially I am telling my master who owns me, I'm telling him, I don't like the way that you're using me. That's an issue. He's the master. I'm the vessel. He's the potter. I'm the clay. He has the right to mold me and make me and set me where he wants me and use me the way that he wants me to be used. And I can tell you this, the quicker you and I learn that and, and become convinced of that, the better we're going to be of use to him. And that's what we're going to see as we move on here. I want to give you number two here is the diversity of vessels. The diversity of vessels. In verse 19, we see the declaration that God makes, I know them that are his. And because I know them that are hit, or hit mine, I know them that are mine, God knows you. Here's what He desires for you. The end of verse 19. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. And we can see that again in some of the scripture we looked at in the first service this morning about God's will for us is sanctification. That we abstain from fornication. And fornication being one of those specific sins and iniquities that God desires us to put out, to put away, and not to have part of our life. But he goes on there in verse 20 and he says, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth and some to honor, and some to dishonor. Now you can think about your house, I think about my house, all right? And I've got a few vessels here to show you this morning. All right? Sorry, it's empty, otherwise I'd have given you a drink, all right? 
But we've got a vessel that we use to usually mix up some kind of liquid that we can drink, right? Sometimes it gets filled with water. Um, sometimes we take some strawberries out of the garden and mint out of the garden and make some strawberry lemonade. That's a, that's a good use of this vessel right here, right? Uh, make y'all thirsty this morning. And then you take that vessel and, and you have another vessel that you utilize. And, and, and here's the thing. This vessel may be utilized to mix something up to pour into this vessel. But I never have seen any of our family use this vessel to mix something up and pour it into here. Now, I shouldn't say that because I know what my boys are going to do next time. They're setting the table. I'm going to see the water for the family will be in this jug here, you know. Well, Dad, here you go. Try to pour this. You know, shit, son, it's not working. And then I'm going to pour it on their heads. Dad, that would be a good use of that, right? But we carry this vessel to drink out of. And we utilize this vessel uh, for the purpose of, of, of making uh, the drink, all right? And then, uh, and then you got other kind of vessels like this thing here, right? This is one I think my daughter made, right, Kylie? She, she, she made this thing, and it's, whoa, almost dropped it there. But this is, is clay, right? And, and it's got fire, and it's tempered. And, and it, actually, if you ever take the time to, to study some of the clay stuff, it's pretty pretty interesting in, in the parallels uh, that God makes with us being clay and, and how impurities can really uh, create issue with uh, a piece of pottery and uh, they have to make sure and work those things out and then when it gets heated up and it gets fired that's when it really becomes of, of use. If you ever try to use soft clay and make a dish and then try to use that to hold your cereal it doesn't quite work. It just kind of falls over. But after the fire has been in it, it really, but, but this is a different shape. It's a different size. It has a different purpose, right? A different purpose. And when we go through these vessels and, and, and we can find, uh, here's one called hot chocolate. Hot chocolate. Now, maybe that's what you would use it for. Maybe you wouldn't use it for, but it would be a good uh, one to Put hot chocolate in and keep it. That doesn't appeal to me right now because I'm warm. But in the winter time, when you got some snow on the ground, right? Maybe you want a, a hot chocolate vessel. And then we start moving up a little bit. Now this is one of those vessels that we typically don't use on our table. Why? Because I have a four-year-old boy and a seven-year-old boy or eight-year-old boy. What? Are, Jayden, how old are you? Seven and uh, uh, soon to be ten year old boy. I mean, uh, yeah, you're not kidding. They're gonna go, huh? What in the world? But you know, this one may have when you come over for dinner, we might put this one out. All right, now if you come over and break it, don't feel too bad. It's just my wife's only prized vessel that she owns. Yes. But again, it's another different vessel. It doesn't look like any of these other vessels. It has a purpose. It has a specific uh, function that it utilizes within uh, our, our house. And, and then you get smaller vessels, right? And, and fine china that has some stenciling on it and silver linings and, and fine china from China. <laughs> hey, it works, right? You know? But, but this one might be a little more precious and this one might only make it out uh, once or twice a year when we have a very formal dinner and everybody dresses up and, and then we're going to put some uh, special uh, gravy or something in it. That, that This is a, uh, uh, what did you say? Cream? I don't drink coffee. We don't use the creamer in our house. We use gravy on biscuits and gravy on roast, all right? That's... I know my vessels, all right? Okay, you, I, I'm preaching up here this morning. <clears throat> and then we have the vessel that we always use. <laughs> the safe vessel, right? And it's a jug. And you can go and you can buy this jug actually completely filled for a dollar. Not because the jug's worth a dollar, but because of the contents, right? But it's not a very important vessel. In fact, most of you have probably squished a lot of these in your life and put them into the recycle can and let them go, right? Because, and not one time have I squished a gallon plastic jug that my wife went, oh, why did you do that? That thing's valuable. I look at her like, honey, come on. I know my vessels, right? 
when you consider this scripture here, we realize that in a great house, we have vessels that are of gold and of silver. Now that equates over to valuable, that equates over to precious, that equates over to uh, someone uh, who would, would really pay attention to those particular uh, vessels. I mean, if, you, if somebody's going to break in your house and steal stuff, they're not going to go for the gallon jug that's in plastic, right? They're going to find something that, it, well, if you have it, gold, or if you have silver, or you have something like that, they're going to go for those kind of vessels. Maybe not because they like the vessel, but they like what it stands for and the preciousness of that. But also in the house, there's vessels of wood, and there's vessels of earth. There's clay uh, pots. There's, there's wooden things. And, and, and we were working in Bible times. That would have been certainly something common in those households, but the recognition would have been that's not a is valuable. I can, I can buy those for pennies on the dollar compared to the gold and the silver. And what is the Lord trying to bring about in this uh, conclusion of this uh, diversity of vessels is this, some to honor and some to dishonor. Some to honor and some to to dishonor. Now I know there's a few different applications for this. When you go over to the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 9, you see some uh, scriptures that mention about uh, how God can utilize certain lies uh, uh, for a certain way and utilize certain other lies for another way. I know it's a, a confusing passage for many and sometimes it, it, it gets into a false doctrine of Calvinism and election and things of, of that kind of thing, but I believe that if you really look at that chapter, you'll find that we're talking about Israel, Israel, and why did God, uh, uh, why did God make Israel His chosen people? And when you talk about the word Israel, you're, you, you, many people go back to Abraham, but you know it wasn't just Abraham. Uh, Abraham would have been the father, but then it had to go through several other generations to follow that line of chosen people. Esau wasn't part of God's chosen people, right? Because Isaac, uh, God chose Isaac, and then God chose Jacob. Jacob, he didn't choose these all, he chose Jacob. And then you keep going down the 12 tribes and so on and so forth. But, but this is the, the perspective here is that, you know, God can utilize vessels, some for honor and some for dishonor. Now, let me put that in layman's terms. You're going to bring glory, glory to God in some way or another. You're either going to bring glory to God living for him or you're going to bring glory to God not living for Him. You know what I mean by that? God makes it very plain in the Scripture that His truth is truth. Amen? And there's no doubt about it. And some people prove His truth to be truth by obeying and doing exactly what God wants them to do. Some people prove this is truth by doing the opposite of obedience and finding out the consequences that God pronounced on disobedience actually come to pass. They both bring glory to God, but one brings it in a dishonoring way and one of it brings in an honoring way. Now I bring you to this point, well, what kind of vessel do you want to be? What kind of vessel in God's hands do you want to uh, e exhibit in this life? Do you want to be a vessel unto honor? or a vessel unto dishonor. And, and I think in, in the specific application this morning, I think if you, if you consider the fact that if, if you're not God's, then you're already a vessel of dishonor. Until you become God's, you have no chance of being a vessel of honor. But even as a saved individual today, listen, you have an opportunity to be a vessel unto honor. You have also an opportunity to be a vessel unto dishonor. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. That goes good for the saved individual as well as the lost individual. The saved person can sow to the Spirit and reap life everlasting. The saved person can also sow to the flesh, just like Lot did, and reap destruction. Do you realize that Lot lost everything? And yet the Bible calls him a righteous man. He was a vessel unto dishonor. And why? Well, because of what the scripture says here. 
Remember back as I mentioned in verse 18, I'm sorry, verse 19. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Depart from iniquity. I want to move into this third point this morning because I want you and I to get a good understanding here of the description of a godly vessel. The description of a godly vessel. When, when God commanded us to depart from iniquity, he, His desire is this, that there is no sin left unrepentant, left undealt with within our hearts. Today, if you are involved in any kind of sin, you are, you, you're, you're going down the wrong path of being a vessel of dishonor. You're in the wrong state of what we would classify as out of God's will. We live in a society today where sin is not really preached on that much. I appreciated the speaker at camp because he preached on some specific sins. He preached on the sin of pride. He preached on the sin of fornication. And, and he, he laid some things out there. He, he preached the truth there on some things that we need to hear. You see, we've got a mentality that we have to overcome that whatever goes, we're under grace, we can live any way we want to live, we just claim to, to be a Christian and, we, and, and maybe we are a Christian, maybe we're not a Christian, but it doesn't matter uh, what you're doing with your life, right? All that matters is that Jesus is your Savior. Folks, they're not reading their Bible, because it matters that if you are a Christian, if you claim the name of Christ today, the Bible's very clear, depart from iniquity. Now that means I'm going to physically remove myself from that sin. I'm going to overcome it. I'm going to seek God's victory over it. I'm not going to be content to dwell with it and just to say, well, that's, who, that's how we all are. It's just That's the way life is. You know what? You just go ahead and deal with it. No, you get the victory over it. And that sin, the, 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 again, the Bible is not specific. Well, if you want to be a good vessel, then as long as you don't have any pride in your life, you'll be all right. So depart from pride. No, it says depart from iniquity. It might be pride, it might be rebellion, it might be moral impurity, it might be bitterness, it might be greed, temporal values. It, it, there's a whole list of things that it could fit within that every one of us, if we're going to be honest with God today, that there's going to be at least something there that we're going to struggle with that we need to take to heart this morning and say, I need to depart from that. Now notice in verse 21, if a man therefore purge himself, from these. Purge himself from these. Again, these referring back to let everyone that named the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Referring back to shunning profane and vain babblings. <coughs> referring back to sticking to the truth. Okay, let everyone depart from these. And then he gives us a list here. He shall be a vessel unto, what's that next word? Honor. Honor. The first thing is precious. Precious. A godly vessel is described as precious. It's of great value. Highly esteemed. Dignified. Compared to those of dishonor. Now, you're not going to grab this jug today and you're going to say, Oh, Pastor, that is just such a precious jug. Such a precious Kroger distilled water. Wow. You guys are going to go, For real? Give me. Be real. Now, maybe you would agree this one's precious. I would say this one's precious because my daughter made it. And she's precious. So therefore, what she makes in my mind is precious. Now she may disagree and say, Dad, that was the worst thing I've ever made. But I'd say it's precious. We get some things laced with silver or things with gold and we would say, wow, that's precious. Why? Because it's of great value. Now understand this today. You and I are the vessel and we have an opportunity of being 
a precious vessel. You say, well, I'm already precious. <laughs> Who do you think you are? I know God loves us and I know God cares about us and I know that we're esteemed in His eyes. But here's the reality. When we'll take His word at what it says and follow it, then we can be precious. I'm convinced that God's limited to how He can use you based on how you deal with the sin in your life. You let it there, explain it away, He's not going to be able to use you that much. But you go and be what God wants you to be and you deal with that sin. And don't settle for any kind of sin that's there. No matter what it is, no matter, no matter how tempting it is or, or, or how much you want to explain it away or how much you want to, you know, just, well, that's the way it always has been. D don't get into that mindset. Get into this mindset. I want to be a vessel of great value. I want to be precious in God's eyes. I want to be precious in God's hands. But it's not just precious. The next one there is pure. Pure. He uses the word sanctified. He says, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, sanctified. And again, if you purge yourself from these, if you depart from iniquity, if you don't let yourself get content to dwell with sin, but rather because of what Jesus Christ has done for us, and now we can be forgiven of that sin, we also can conquer that sin. You see, we get into this mindset, a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump, but yet we think a little leaven is okay. <laughs> Well, pastor, I'm better than so-and-so, or I don't do this, and I don't do that, but yeah, I know I have this thing over here, but it's not that big of a deal. And by the way, God knows your secret sins too. You think you got everybody else filled, uh, uh, not filled, fooled, you don't got God fooled. He knows those things that are there. That's why it's important for us to deal with Him in departing from this iniquity. That word sanctified means to make holy, to purify, to set apart, to consecrate. We use the word separated, right? Separated. It's God's will for us to be separated from the world, not from the standpoint. In fact, if you get into, I believe it's in Corinthians, it talks about having uh, no fellowship with a fornicator. Fornicator. Somebody who's involved in moral impurity. When you think of that verse, and, and yet it, it, it emphasizes this, he says, but none of the fornicators of the world. Because if we didn't have any fellowship with the fornicators of the world, then we might as well just get out of the world. Because we wouldn't have any business to, to be able to share the, the, the message of salvation. But it says specifically, somebody who's claiming the name of Christ, who's a fornicator, you remove yourself from that individual. Why? Because God's desire is for us to be a vessel unto honor. A vessel that is sanctified. You say, well, pastor, that's not very loving. Of course it's loving. Because I want them to get right. And if God tells me this is what I need to do, then I trust that God means this is what will help them get right. This is what God can utilize in their life. Instead, here's what we'll do. We'll preach on it and teach on it until it happens in our own home. And when it happens in our own home, then we'll embrace it. Or our best friend, and we'll embrace it. Or we personally start to slip and fall into it. And then it's all of a sudden, oh, it's not really that big of a sin. Why was it a big sin a year ago? Because it's a big sin. Stop, stop, stop. What does God want? We claim His name, we depart from iniquity. Let's get, that, let's get that across our hearts and across our minds this morning. Number three, how about a profitable vessel? A profitable vessel. He says there, again in verse 21, He shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the Master's use. Meet for the Master's use. This means... Easy to make use of, useful. Easy to make use of, useful. This particular vessel, uh, it is um, Miss Cherie's famous Tupperware, right? And it has, got, it has got a very useful lid on it because theoretically when that thing is shut, it's not going to leak out. I, I guess I could try it this morning and see if it works or not, but uh, we'll pass on that, right? But you know, the funny thing is, if somebody has never seen this thing, they, they want something, they want whatever's inside of it, and they're, I can't, what's wrong with it? How do I get this thing out, you know? But the reality is, you just come up and push it with your thumb, and it pops open, and you pour it out, and close it. It's actually kind of useful, right? But when you don't know, it's a little bit, mm. Now, here's the thing. When, when we come into this life, 
we can pretty much just kind of go ahead and, and admit we're not the most useful to God. Right? You're not God's gift to mankind. Sorry to burst your bubble. But God gives more grace to the humble, so maybe really that'll help you. Here is the thing, though. When we depart from iniquity and we, we don't let that in our life, then God says that we become meat for His use. We become useful in His hands. Now, now, what do I conclude from that? I conclude in this sense that if I want to be a vessel in God's hands, the most important thing for me is to get rid of the iniquity in my heart. Is not to dwell with sin in my life. Not to be content with my uh, uh, sinful old nature taking over, right? It's to be dead to those things. It's to be alive unto the Spirit. Because at that point, God says, listen, you're ready for me to be able to do something with you. Well, amen, let's get on with it then, Lord, right? Now, we still have to be careful because the mindset of a vessel is whatever the master wants. And if the master wants to use us in a way that we don't want to be used, then it's still his right and still what he can do. But I love that perspective of being profitable because too many times I think in this world, and, and I'm guilty of this one, I try to make myself profitable. I try to get out there and I'm going to do this and I'm going to be the best pastor there is. I'm going to preach the greatest messages there are. I'm going to build the church and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And then God goes, <laughs> you're so funny because you're not going to do any of that. And what does God say to me? He says, quit trying to be the best pastor you could ever be. Here's what I want you to be. A vessel in my hands. Well, I'm going to be the best dad. My kids are going to do this. My kids are going to do that. And, and you know what? I'm going to be... I'm get... Stop trying to be the best dad. Be a vessel. Why? Well, because God can father my kids a whole lot better than I can. So when He is the dad through me, you know what? They're going to get the greatest uprising, upbringing they can. Uprising? No. Upbringing that they can. Why? Because God can work through my life because I'm a vessel. Well, I'm going to get out there and I'm going to share the gospel and I'm going to give, you know what, this afternoon is outreach and I'm just going to be the best soul winner on the group and I'm going to talk to all the people I can and I'm going to, I'm going to bring some to Christ and I'm going to lead them and they're going to get saved and this is just going to be wonderful. If you're going to do it, you're going to fail. But if you're a vessel today and you go in this thing and you just say, Lord, forgive me of this sin and forgive me of that sin. You showed it to me today and I'm so sorry. I don't want it in my life. I want to be pure. And the Lord says, now you're ready. Now I can do something with you. And He can just flow through us, pouring out that living water or that bread of life. The last one we see here is prepared. Prepared. This kind of goes along with the profitable. But profitable is easy to make use of. It's okay, I've got it. I've got you. Now that you're in this position that you're in, I can easily utilize your life for my glory. But then prepared is to make ready. To make ready. He says it in this way. He says, a meat for the master's use in that last statement, and prepared unto every Good work. What does that mean? Fitted, adapted, made suitable. You know, God says that we are to shine as lights. And one of the ways we shine is for our good works to be evident before people. Why? Because our good works can point to our Heavenly Father. They can see them and they can glorify our God. But good works are not always easy to come by. But as we get to this position of being utilized for Christ and, and we say, Lord, I'm going to depart from this iniquity. I'm going to be your vessel. Here I am, Lord. Take me. Do what you will with my life. And God says, now you're ready. So you are prepared for me to be able to shine through you. And that comes just to every good work. Now what do you think will 
result in that kind of vessel. A vessel that is pure, a, a vessel that is precious, a vessel that is profitable, and a vessel that is prepared will accomplish what the master wants to do with that vessel. See, it's amazing truth. Don't miss it. 